Hello, my name is Antonina Piralski and I'm University Assistant at the Department of Innovation and Digitalization in Law. And today I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the topic of data protection law. To begin with, it is important to remember that there is no one single piece of legislation regulating data protection in the EU. As you see on the slide, there are at least four important pieces of legislation. First one, the most important one for us, as we're going to focus on it in the lecture, is the so-called general data protection regulation. Uh, we're going to talk about it more detail soon. But before we move on, let's take a brief look at the other three. The directive, the law enforcement directive, regulates processing personal data for the purposes of law enforcement, that is, for the purposes of fight against crime or terrorism. Another directive, which you can see here, is the so-called e-privacy directive, which would soon be replaced by e-privacy regulation. Its main focus is put on securing confidentiality of electronic communications. And the last one here is a regulation that regulates processing of personal data by European institutions. So, the GDPR, first of all, as it's already clear when looking at the name of it, it's a regulation. What does it mean? It is not a directive. That means it does not require transposition into national legal systems. It is directly applicable. So basically, everything you're going to find in the GDPR is applicable to you or to anyone who's processing personal data directly. Regarding the scope of the GDPR, that's something new that was not present in the old Data Protection Directive. It is also applicable to entities which process personal data even though if they do not have their seat on the territory of the EU. Every time they're offering goods or services to people living in the EU or are monitoring behavior of the people living in the EU, even if their seat is somewhere on the other side of the world, GDPR still applies. Another thing are the opening clauses. What is it? Well, normally, as it's clear from principles of EU law, regulation applies directly. But there are some exceptions to it. And we can find them in the GDPR. Sometimes the European legislator left some very specific, narrow issues to be regulated by the member states. The standard phrasing of an opening clause would be something, 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 comma, unless it's differently regulated by the member states. So every time you're going to find a clause like that, it means that you then have to look into national legislation, how this specific issue would be regulated. The basic principle that governs the GDPR is very simple. Processing of personal data is prohibited unless it's permitted. So you cannot just start processing personal data if you want to. You have to find some gr legal grounds in the GDPR that would allow you to do that. What else can we find in the GDPR? For example, the data processing principles. These are general abstract rules that set out a framework on how personal data should be processed. Also, the GDPR grants a number of rights to the data subjects. We're going to talk about them in the next video. It also regulates responsibilities, liabilities, of people or entities that process personal data. And in case they would not observe the GDPR, also penalties that can be given to them. Here is a visualization of roles that we can find in the GDPR. There are three groups of subjects that we can find there. 
controller, data subject, and processor. Here we have some definitions from the GDPR. So, as you can see, controller is a person or an entity that determines the purposes and means of processing of personal data. So, that's person or entity that would make the final decision how and for what purpose, for how long, with which means, the personal data would be processed. Processor is again a person or an entity that is physically actually processing personal data on behalf of the controller. It means that it receives instructions from the controller on how to process the personal data. In most of the cases it happens, for example, uh, in the context of outsourcing, when the controller does not have technical means to process personal data and then outsources it to another entity, which would then be a processor. And last but not least, data subject. That is an identified or identifiable natural person. So three things here. It's a natural person. It's not a legal entity. It's not a company. It's not a public office. It's always just a natural person. Identified or identifiable. Identified means that if you can take a look at the personal data, you automatically know to which person does this data relate to. If it's identifiable, it means that at the very moment you cannot relate this data to a person, but it would be possible, for example, in a different context. Central question that we need to answer before, before we're going to talk about GDPR in more detail is what is personal data and how is it different from anonymous or non-personal data? Because the GDPR only applies to processing of personal data. If you're going to process anonymous data, you do not need to care about the GDPR. Here you have a small graph. As you can see, we have two major sets of data, personal and anonymous. In other words, non-personal. And somewhere in the middle of all of that, we have a set that is called machine-generated data. That is everything that's generated by machines, clearly. For example, industrial sensors or smartphones or anything that does not require an action of a human. As you can see, machine-generated data covers both personal and anonymous. So please keep that in mind. The definition of personal data can be also found in GDPR, although it's a very peculiar definition. It's a flexible definition. Why? As you can see, the GDPR defines personal data as any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. So, there is no exhaustive list in the GDPR on what personal data is or is not. If you look here, you'll find the phrase in particular. Every time you find a phrase in particular in any legal act, it means that everything that follows is a non-exhaustive list. These are only examples. But using this part of the definition that is before the phrase in particular, you can find another examples of personal data, right? So here is an, an, a list of some examples introduced by the GDPR, but it's not all of that. Here, for example, we can see what personal data could be. It can be a name or a surname, date of birth, home address, record of DNA, but it can be much, much more. If you look at this slide, you'll see that there are basically two groups of personal data here. One group are the so-called identifiers. That is data that just at a first glance it's clear to you to which person it relates, like name, surname, date of birth, home address. But there are also different data 
data that can reveal habits of a natural person. Take, for example, an airline that collects data about their passengers, about how often do they travel, where do they travel, what do they eat on the plane, what do they buy in the duty-free zone before they board the plane. So if the airline possesses all of these data or has access to all of these data, they can reconstruct habits of natural persons, shopping habits, traveling habits, dietary habits. And this is also considered personal data and therefore protected by the GDPR. So once we clarified what personal data is, now we're going to talk what anonymous or otherwise non-personal data is. There are two types of anonymous data. Data that originally did not relate to an identifiable natural person, like, for example, everything that was produced by industry sensors. Or anonymous data could also be personal data that had undergone the process of anonymization. As I said before, anonymous data is not regulated by the GDPR. There is a new regulation on a, fr on, on a framework for the free flow of non-personal data in the EU. Here on the slide you have a link. Please feel free to take a brief look at this regulation. As I said, personal data can be turned into anonymous data by the process of anonymization. Why is it important? Clearly, if you're dealing with anonymous data, you do not need to observe GDPR. So, if an institution or organization will decide that they do not need the data in a, in a, in a form that allows identification of, per, of a natural person, but they still need the data, then they can anonymize that and use it outside of the scope of GDPR. The process of anonymization is, in theory at least, very simple. You need to break the link between data and an identifiable natural person. The GDPR does not tell us how this should happen exactly. There is only a very simple threshold. All means that are reasonably likely to be used by anyone to identify a person, directly or indirectly, need to be considered. So that's not an absolute process. You just need to fulfill the threshold of reasonable likelihood to meet the requirements of the GDPR. There are no specific technical requirements on how this process should be conducted. The controller is only obliged to use the technology that is available at the moment. For example, for now, it would be deleting identifiers that is, for example, deleting names and surnames that relate to personal data you're storing, or aggregation or randomization. And that would be all. Thank you for your attention.